Your 60 seconds has come and gone. Thanks for going out of your way to greet somebody. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 54.4. Psalm 54.4. And we've been in a series of actually how we can know God. And, and uh, we've talked about it from a lot of different angles, actually. You know, I, I, was, um, I was intrigued, you know, when my, uh, my uh, kids, grandkids, started to swim. And I noticed this particularly with Evelyn. Um, you know, she was afraid of the water. She didn't like the water, you know, because I was going to teach her how to swim. She wouldn't move her arms, you know, the right direction. She wouldn't kick her legs. And then it occurred to me, she didn't know how to hold her breath. The basics of swimming is learning how to hold your breath. If you don't know how to hold your breath... You're going to suck in water, and you're going to hate it. You're going to spit and cough. You're going to feel like you're drowning. And I thought, I need to take her to the very basics of learning how to swim. i got to teach her how to hold her breath. Do you know that was a trip in and of itself? And I said, okay, honey, now I'm going to, I'm going to take you under the water. No, 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 no. I said, take a big breath. <gasps> and then I'd take her down. I'd bring her back up. First couple times, it didn't work. She was breathing in when I was taking her down. You know, you know it's, it's, you know, we don't think about it, but it's, 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 a, it's a journey to learn how to hold your breath when it comes to water. Now, I didn't have that same, you know, my father taught me how to swim. He just threw me in the pond. Yep. Said, swim, boy, or drown. Yeah. I come up spitting and coughing in that pond of gunky water, seaweed in my mouth. Oh, yeah, it was a tough deal. I didn't, I didn't learn how to swim until I could learn how to hold my breath. Can I tell you something? You'll never learn how to walk with God until you know God. That's why we've been on this series of talking about how to know God. A lot of people struggle in their walk with God and they're, they're struggling to figure out how this whole dynamic works and they can't figure it out because they keep drowning. They keep going under and spitting and can't figure out how to get air, how to walk with God. We've been talking a lot about how God is your creator. It's an important thing to know that He's the one that created you. But today I want to talk about that He is actually your helper. Now, I know this is really, oh, I don't know, elementary, but until you know that God is your helper, your response to Him will always be wrong. You will not know how to walk with Him because you don't see Him as your helper. In fact, some do think or even believe that God may have created them, but then He kind of leaves them alone. Sort of like Darwin came in his theory of evolution, that God indeed had created the world and humanity, but then he just took his hands off of it, left it alone to kind of be on its own. And, and so it evolved, and the strongest survive. And so he came up with this idea. And part of the reason that he came up with that idea is because he actually went to med school, but he kind of dropped out of that. His father was concerned about him. He was a doctor, and, and he's like, this kid just needs some structure in life. So he sent him to Bible school, theology, to seminary. And so he went to seminary. He didn't have a strong faith in God, but he went to seminary. He got a degree. When he graduated from seminary, he left the seminary and boarded the HHS ship for the islands. was on there five years, going back and forth. And it was painting a picture in his mind of what he thought, of what he believed God was. He married Emma and had his first child, a boy, and his second child, Annie. And he was struggling along these lines of God doesn't really help you. He sort of, I, I, I don't know where this is. And his wife, Emma, was a strong believer in the Anglican church. And she said, you can't, you can't talk about this way because we married forever. I believe that you'll be with me forever. And if you're not a believer, you're not going to be with me forever. And then their 10-year-old Annie died. And it crushed him. She was kind of the life of their family, the, the child everybody likes. I think they had six children. 
And she was just a joy to be around. In his letters that he wrote after she first died, he said, I want to write this down because I'm concerned that I'll forget about it years later. I want to write it while it's fresh in my mind. And he writes about how the beauty of this child brought to their home. She was so easy to go along with. She lit up every room she was in. She cared deeply about others. And then she died and it crushed him. And he said to himself, you see, wife, I'm telling you, God creates us, but then he takes his hand off of us. There is no help from him. Our child is gone. Some way, some another, maybe in another life, she'll come back to us. I don't know. But I know that God is not our help. Three years later, he published a book that had been in his mind for about 20 years, Theory of Evolution. Belief. It's an interesting thing in our life. Where is God, we ask? Maybe he's not involved. Maybe he just doesn't care because I don't feel like he helps. But that opinion, I'm telling you, forgets that you live in a fallen world a fallen world of sin, that you and I actually face an enemy who is not only the enemy of God, but is your enemy. And he's not God. God is not your enemy. And this enemy actually seeks to devour your life, devour your identity, devour your trust, devour your faith. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Even insurance policies in our culture accuse God when it comes to natural disasters, or natural uh, storms that happen. Acts of God, they declare. No one's responsible but God. Amazingly, we often confuse God with Satan. And Jesus defined this clear difference in Scripture, revealing that Satan is a murderer. He's the one who is a murderer from the beginning. He did not abide in truth, nor is there any truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature. And when we get the two mixed up, God and Satan, well, we become completely disoriented in how we live life because we leave Satan completely out of it and we accuse God of everything wrong in our life. Or we deny him because of how many problems we face. We throw God out of our lives when we should be throwing Satan out of our lives. The Bible says we should cast him out, resist him, stand against him. The Bible tells us not to give him any place. Yet we tend to just allow him to stay and we accuse God or throw God out. When we get the two mixed up, we get ourselves in a pile of hot water. Kind of like the story of the businessman who jumped on a train because he had a very special and important meeting that he had to get scheduled, so he had to take the red-eye train to get to his destination. Knowing he would be in a deep sleep when the train stopped at 3 in the morning, he grabbed an attendant porter and he requested some help. He said, listen, I, I have the most important meeting of my life in the morning and I cannot miss it. When the train arrives in Chattanooga at 3 a.m., wake me up and get me off the train. Yes, sir, the porter replied. Now he said, listen, I'm going to probably be grumpy. I'll probably be incorrigible because I like my sleep. I'll probably beg you to let me sleep. But you do whatever it takes to get me off this train. And he gave him a $100 bill. The next morning when the man awakes, he's still on the train. And he sees that he's missed his stop. And he is livid, angry. He finds the porter, and he begins to ream him out, raging in his face an inch from his nose, cussing him out for not getting him off the train, and the porter stands there silent, never replies. When this irate, out-of-control passenger finally storms away, a passenger who's sitting there, sees the whole thing and says to the porter, wow, I am so sorry. In all my life, I have never seen anybody get so upset. I got to tell you, you really handled it well. The porter said, oh, it's nothing. 
You should have seen the guy I threw off the train at 3 a.m. at Chattanooga. <clears throat> when, we, when we get God and Satan confused, can I tell you, we throw a lot of stuff off our train that shouldn't be going off our train. We throw a lot of things out of our life that we don't even realize we need. God is not your enemy. God is your help. Psalm 54.4, that's where I told you to turn, says, look and see. Look and see. God is my helper. Behold is the way the King James says it. Behold, God is my helper. It's the Lord who upholds my life. David wrote this when the Ziphites had betrayed David and revealed his hiding place to King Saul. And now he not only feels betrayed, he feels open and exposed. And he says, look and see, the Lord is my help. Isaiah 41.10 says, don't be afraid. Don't get discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you you. I will uphold you. Hebrews 13, 5 says, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, and I won't fear what man can do to me. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge. He's our strength, a very present help in trouble. Hebrews 4, 16 says, come boldly to the throne of grace so that you may receive mercy and get grace in your time of need. God will help you. Psalm 118, 6 says, the Lord is on my side as my helper. He's on my side. How? As my helper. I shall have the look of triumph to the enemies who look into my face. Why do we say that? Because the Lord will help me. John 14, 26, Jesus said, but the helper, the comforter, Literally translated, helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name. He will teach you what you need. He'll help you. He will bring the things that I have said back to your remembrance. He will help you. I was driving in the car. We took quite a trip this last week. We're to book a convention and then up to Minnesota for a minister's meeting, then back here to Iowa. And on the way, I was making some calls and one of the things I had to uh, turn in was a model number. And so I said, uh, you know, so I said, you know, what's some, and a model number was long. It had numbers and letters. And uh, so I, you know, I repeated it. And then I told Peggy, what was that again? And, and then she said it back to me. And then I repeated it. And then she repeated it. And then I called and said, okay, here's the model number. And it's, you know, KY126, you know, and, and Peggy's like, J5 for she helped me. She brought it back to my remembrance. God said the Holy Spirit will remind you what Jesus says to you, what he's taught you. No wonder 2 Chronicles 14, 11 says, King Asa cried to the Lord, O Lord, there is none like you who helps. There is none like you who helps between the mighty and the weak. Lord, we rely on you and in your name we will come against this great multitude for you are our Lord and our help. Let not man prevail against me. What a, what a, what a powerful thing it is to know that God will help you. He'll help you. God is your help. Say it out loud. God will, help me. God will help me. It's a pretty big statement to make, isn't it? Because many times we feel like God doesn't help us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how to live beyond your means. Because God will help you. Now, I'm not talking about financially being foolish and spending more than you earn. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living beyond your own means because the Lord helps you. What do I do with an illness I can't overcome? He'll help you. What do I do in a marriage that's crumbling? He'll help me. What do I do with prodigal children? He will help 
you. What, what am I going to do with the financial resources I have that's not enough? He will help you. He's your help. What do I do with a business that I know needs to grow, but I don't know how to grow it? God will help you because you need his help. You can't solve all your problems. You can't fix all your trouble. You can't handle all hell's diabolical schemes that are put against you. You need God's help. You can't conquer your addiction by yourself. You can't make your marriage rewarding by yourself. You can't achieve success by yourself. You can't find happiness by yourself. You can't because you're not big enough, you're not smart enough, you're not wise enough, you're not strong enough, you're not young enough, you're not rich enough. You need the help of the one who's more than enough. You need help. This is what I mean when I say God will help you. He will help you live beyond your means, to live beyond your own abilities. He will help you grow he will help you develop. You know the hardest person to lead is you? You're the hardest person to lead. I don't mean from me to me, me to you. I mean just you to you. And leading takes a help that we often talk about coaching. You need a coach. You know Tiger Woods is, was at the top of his game or Jack Nicholas before him at the top of his game or what was his name? Arnie Palmer, top of his game. Do you know all of them had a coach? They had someone who helped them because they couldn't see where they needed to make their own corrections. Their coaches actually couldn't play better than they could, but they could help them. God is your help. He'll help you live beyond your own resources. That's what I mean when I'm talking about that. God will help you raise your children. He'll help you in your marriage. He'll help you be free of your anxiety. He'll help you be free of fear and oppression and burden. I'm going to look at the book of Zechariah for just a few moments because it's in this portion of Scripture where the prophet actually speaks to Zerubbabel about how the Lord will help. It's the story of the prophet who is speaking to a nation and a king about how God is there to help them. It's a powerful book when you read it because it's really a book about leadership and how a person changes the dynamic around through leadership because of the help of God. His focus is on vision and purpose, and I'll tell you why they're both important. People together in Israel had forgotten the purpose that God had created them for, and they'd lost vision. Just as Proverbs 29 says, without a vision, people perish. You need a vision. It will help you. And oftentimes, we've lost our vision because we've lost our purpose. We don't even know why we exist or what our purpose is. And the people together with God had forsaken the purpose. And why? Well, they were in slavery. They'd been taken back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had gotten them. And then the Persian king came in and overthrew Babylon. And Israel was still there. And then the prison or the Persian king sent a, a remnant of the Israelis back, the Jewish people, back to the land of Israel to kind of rebuild their city and rebuild their temple, their God, and worship because it helped the whole nation under the king's rule. So they send them back, but the, the place lay in ruins. There was no resources. They couldn't seem to get the wall built. This is the whole story of one book where a man comes from a king and goes back and helps build a wall. Maybe you've read it. Maybe I've piqued your interest enough to go look. And in this book, Haggai comes as a prophet and speaks to them about that everything that they're doing is like holes in their pocket. Every effort that they're creating is not gaining them anything. It's like taking money and putting holes in your pocket. You got it, but you're not warmed by it. You got clothes, but they don't keep you warm. You got food, but you're not filled. You got water, but you're still thirsty. You got money, but it's like you got holes in your pocket, Haggai says, because you don't know where your help comes from. Now Zerubbabel, the prophet, is speaking to the people, and he's reminding them God does not forget his promise to you. 
He is a covenant-keeping God, and He will not break it. Anybody ever had someone make a promise they didn't keep? Not God. And maybe they felt like God hadn't kept His promise because they had gone into slavery, but they had walked away from God. And so they'd found themselves in slavery. And now Zechariah says, God is your covenant keeper. He will keep His promise to you because He is your helper. He will help you. But they weren't interested. (laughs) Where had He been when the king had come in and overridden their nation? Where was God when I was in slavery in Babylon? Where was God when my wife or my husband was killed in the war? Where was God? No help then. And Zerubbabel comes to tell them that you've forgotten God and you've walked away from Him. You haven't called upon Him. That's the very reason you got into the trouble you were. It's the reason you threw the wrong guy off the train. He's your helper and He won't forsake you. But they weren't interested. And can I tell you something? You ought to write this down. This is the most important point I've got today. When you're not interested, you never learn. When you're not interested, you never learn. Let me teach you how to be a better person. I'm not interested. Let me teach you how to lift weights. Ah, I'm not really interested. Let me teach you how to balance your checkbook. Ah, I'm not interested. Let me teach you how to be a better husband. You know, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm not really interested. When you're not interested, you never learn. And they weren't interested. Zerubbabel says, God wants to help you. They're like, yeah. I don't know that he wants to help us. Besides, I'm not really interested. And when you're not interested, you never learn. Here's where we get the saying. People who don't learn from history will make the same mistakes over and over again. And you can see it in nations. You can see it in families. You can see it in individuals. You can see it in any kind of leadership. When people don't learn from past mistakes, when they don't learn from history, They'll repeat them. And so we have a saying for it. We call it generational curse because it just seems to repeat over and over again. Freud called it repetition compulsion. They seem compelled to repeat the same stupidity over and over again. And why? Simply because they weren't interested. Nudge your neighbor and say, stay interested. Stay interested. Generational curses come because we lose our interest. We just don't seem to be interested in God. And God wants to help you. Zechariah shares the vision. In fact, in the first six chapters, he has eight visions. Eight visions. From chapter 1 to chapter 6. And each vision's focus is on how God will help them. How He will help them. First... I'm just going to only deal with the first vision. The first vision is getting the temple rebuilt. The vision of the worship of God. Without putting God first, without seeking Him first, your life is always going to be in a mess. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So first, you need to rebuild the temple. That's the purpose of your life. You know, you might be young, you might be middle-aged, you might be old, but the purpose is still the same. The function might change. You might not be able to do at old what you could do when you were young, but the purpose never changes. And when you lose your purpose, then you can't figure out how the vision makes sense to you because, well, I've been there, done that, and so I don't want to do the same method again. The method changes. Your function can change. You know, when it comes to leading, uh, when it comes to leading, sometimes you've got to stop doing to lead. We become doers instead of leaders. And as long as you're doing, you can't help lead. And leading is hard work. The God says you will be the head and not the tail. You will lead. That means you will take initiative. You will help other people do. You know, as a, as a family person, One of the things of family is you have to lead. And if you don't lead, if you're just doing, nobody else gets it. You know what Peggy and I figured out? Our children never figured it out by watching us. We assumed our work ethic would be caught rather than taught. 
But it has to be taught. And so we would teach it because they didn't catch it. We assumed attitude would be learned by seeing what our attitude was, but attitude has to be taught. We used to say, you can get happy in the same pants you got mad in. Because it has to be taught. You have to lead. You have to initiate. And when you don't lead, you're just doing. No one else learns to follow. That's why the hardest person to lead is you. Jack Parr said, if I could kick the person in the seat of the pants that's caused me the most problems, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. <laughs> Leading. Zechariah has this vision. He says, can I tell you what your purpose is? God is showing you that your purpose was to rebuild the temple. It was to put God first in the nation, among your families, among your own life. God's habitation had been destroyed because Nebuchadnezzar the king had come in and burned it down, taken it down. And you know what they were like? A lot of people today in the church, church just isn't that important. And probably because they've been through church hurt. And they got hurt in the church, and so I just, that's just not important to me anymore. People are all the same. Yeah, and you're one of them, right? And so people go through church hurt, and they get disassociated from the church, and God says the church is his dream for the world. It's his plan A. There isn't plan B. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I've set gifts in my church to lead the church, to coach the church, to equip the church, to do the work of the ministry. The church is God's goal. It's his purpose for your life, to build his church. But they weren't interested. <laughs> they weren't interested. And the habitation had been destroyed. And so they wanted to, they wanted to do their own thing. Besides, church was just a time waster. It just takes up my time. It's kind of boring anyway, and I don't get much out of it when I do uh, around it. So just, you know, I can love God from a distance. No, you can't. You got to seek Him first. You got to seek Him first. They'd lost the vision. They'd lost their purpose. Zechariah says, here's the picture. You ready for this? Here's the picture that I saw. It was the picture of the future which creates power in your present. As long as you have a right picture of your future, it will create a power in your present. If you don't believe God will help you, you will have no power in your present. Just as Proverbs 29 says, when you lose vision, you will perish. If you can see what could be, then you are motivated in your present situation to change. Like the, like the little community that lived by the nice stream, you know, uh, that came down the mountain and then, you know, the you know, government you, regulations came in and said they're going to build a dam there and create a dam and you had two years to leave, you know, because your, the whole town would be flooded, be underwater. This dam's going to be a power plant, so, you know, we're going to pay you for your homes. You got two years to get somewhere else to leave. You know what happened to that little community in two years? Nothing ever got fixed. Everything became in disrepair. By the time the community left, shingles were missing, fences were broken down, broken windows weren't replaced, potholes in streets were left un, unchanged. The whole city became in disrepair. There's no power in the present when there's no vision for the future. When you don't have a vision of you, you know what I used to ask people who were getting married? I'd say, what do you think your marriage is going to look like in 10 years? Do you know no one could ever answer me that question? <laughs> so when they run into trouble, when they run into difficulty, when they run into things they can't figure out how to fix or resolve, they got no vision of what they wanted their marriage to be. They have no power in their present to fix their overriding difficulties because there's no picture. When you do not see that God will help you, you will not turn to Him. You will not even seek Him. You won't even ask Him. You will just kind of ignore Him and hope He kind of shows up. It's kind of like shooting a shotgun in the air and hoping a BB hits something. I'm short on time, so I'm going to finish as quick as I can. You ready? 
When you get a picture of God willing to help you, it changes your action. Your outside actions will show it. You will not repeat the same mistakes again and again because you know God will help you. We give up too easily and we quit. We come up with excuses. We lack passion. We lose our enthusiasm. We talk like a victim. Nothing ever goes my way. It never gets better and nothing ever changes because God won't help me. Now, chapter 4 is what I'm going to read to you today. I'm going to read it quickly. The angel of the Lord, chapter 4, verse 1. This is Zechariah. Say, where is that? It's in the Old Testament. Can you tell me what book it's by? No, guess. Now, the angel who talked with me came back and awakened me as a man is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, well, I'm, what I'm looking at, there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, there's seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And there's two olive trees that are right by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other's at the left of the bowl. So I answered and I spoke to the angel who talked with me. What the heck is this? It's Monty's translation. What are these, my Lord? Verse 5. The angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No. No, I, I don't. Now, here's what's stunning to me. We often try to put God on our level. Whatever vision we think God is giving, it is usually a vision we want to have, and we want God to okay it. But when God gives us the vision, it's usually above our own comfort zone. In fact, we can't even do it without Him. So we operate on a human level instead of on a God level. And it takes you out of your own comfort zone when you do what God has put in your heart to do. This is, this is why we say, <laughs> this is why we say insanity is just repeating the same thing again and again expecting a different result because we never get a clear vision of what God wants to do. It's not that we don't try or it's not that we don't need help because the Lord will help us, but we just don't see it. That's what Zerubbabel said. I, I, don't, I don't even get what I'm seeing. The picture that he saw was two olive trees in the temple. Now, the temple hadn't been rebuilt yet, but there's never been two olives in the temple that God had built. So what are they doing there? There were the lampstands that had been there, seven lampstands, seven spirits of God, seven eyes of God. That, had, that was in the temple. There were the, the candelabra. They were called something else, but that's what they looked like. They were there. But what's these olive trees? That are, I, don't, I don't get that. And these pipes, this plumbing, what's going on with that? But the Bible teaches us that these olive trees were the source of oil. What do you see? Well, here's what I see, but I don't get it. Why don't you get it? Let me explain it to you. God will give understanding to what doesn't make sense to your own mind. He will give you wisdom to what doesn't make sense to your own foresight. He will help you by showing you a different way than you can do on your own. He will help give sight to what you cannot see. He will give strength to what you cannot endure. Why? Because God will help you. Do you need His help today? Do you? Have you asked for His help? Are you too proud to ask for His help? Are you too scared that He won't help? Are you too insecure that you're not good enough for him to help? God shows Zechariah something that's never been in the temple, these two olive trees. And those two trees were supplying oil to the seven lamps through the plumbing system, through the pipes. One of the tedious tasks in the temple was the constant care of the lamps. The lamps that were on the golden lampstand, they had to be continually refilled with oil, cleaned of soot, wicks maintained. But the vision Zachariah is getting from God is self 
filling lamps being fueled by two olive trees in the temple that never run out by a plumbing structure that had never existed that is feeding the lamps on a continual basis. The very source of light and power was not man's effort or man doing his own work, but it was the spirit of the living God that was pouring the oil into the lamps, this continue abundant living oil that never ends. Leviticus 2 reveals that the olive oil was the symbol of the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that that Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and anointed him to preach, anointed him to heal, anointed him to deliver, anointed him to set people free, anointed him to give sight to the blind, anointed him to give liberty to those who were oppressed. Acts 10 38 says that God anointed with oil Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good and in the power of the Lord healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. The psalmist writes, he will anoint us with fresh oil and we shall be glad. Matthew 25 says when the oil ran out, the girls left the wedding where the bridegroom was coming and missed the second coming of the bridegroom. It was all based on the power of the Holy Spirit. No wonder we need fresh oil. When the Samaritan helps the beaten up Jew who's been robbed and left for dead, what does he do? He takes oil and pours them in his wounds. In Acts 1, Jesus tells us, don't even try to do ministry without the oil, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the exact vision God has given Zechariah. I want you to tell Zerubbabel, hey, Zerubbabel, listen to me. The work that you have to do to rebuild the temple hasn't, can't be done on your own effort alone. You laid the foundation of it, good for you. But I'm telling you now with the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to rebuild this temple. Because this mountain of problem that stands before you, I will make like a plain. You just shout grace to it. Shout grace to that mountain and I'll make it like a plain. Because the oil, the power of the Holy Spirit will come in and cause the temple to rebuild. And Zerubbabel, you're going to build it. Hallelujah. You can fix your problem with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can change your dynamic with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can create a growth in your business through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can create a growth in ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can set people free by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can chase out devils by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can move a mountain by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can be reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is an oil in your life that God wants to pour through you. It's not by your own effort alone. It's by the living olive trees that is flowing that oil to you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, that's a quick that's a quick one. Hallelujah. That's like a two hour teaching, but I did it in 40 minutes. I'm kind of proud of it even though it was lousy. Hallelujah. Bethany already told me this morning, she said, Pastor, she calls me pastor when we're in church. She says, pastor, says my daughter, daughter-in-law. She says, pastor, you know you just came back from being gone a week. I said, yeah. She goes, keep it short. <laughs> I said, what do you think? I've got some stuff built up. She goes, you always do. <laughs> they know me. Come on, let's pray, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you that cancers dissolve by the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that healings Drive sickness, disease, inflammation, bacteria, infection far from people by the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that bones and brains where there's tumors and infections and attacks are driven out by the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you where there is difficulty in business and struggle and the economy is throwing all kinds of mountains in people's ways. I thank you that it's there in the power of the Holy Spirit that things are broken loose and business grows and provision comes in great measure. And I thank you, God, that it blesses and serves people at a greater dimension than man's own strength, their own power. I thank you that the church, glory to God, is not trying anymore to do work on its own, but rather through the 
infilling and power of the Holy Spirit that lives are transformed and changed. Cities are impacted. Communities, rural areas because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the saints comes to them and the power of the Holy Spirit revolutionizes lives in the name of Jesus. Just as we saw in video of the camp, it wasn't all of man's effort that makes a difference. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And I worship you and thank you for the all of trees in our lives. The Holy Spirit filling us, renewing us, a constant abundant flow in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet.